What's going on, everybody? Y'all can hear me good? All right. Good to see y'all. see a lot of friendly faces. What's up, Jay? <laughs> uh, thanks for coming out to Apple Soho Talk. Um, it's amazing. Oh, my sister's here. What's up? <laughs> uh, it's amazing to just be up here, to be able to introduce someone that's a personal inspiration of mine. Um, I remember just buying Vibe magazine, being in high school, going into college, and was just like, all right, who's on the cover this month? Oh, Kevin Powell wrote it. I know it's going to be crazy. And he would always take me on a trip with whatever he was writing about. Sometimes it might be about Tupac and Death Row. Uh, other times it might be about the dream team uh, of Shaq and all of them, the 96 dream team. And then sometimes he would just write a poem uh, about summer. And it would be the most insightful thing that you could read about summer. You know, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce author, poet, and community activist, Kevin Powell. Good, bro. All right. Wow. Oh, man. This is dope. <laughs> this is dope. Thank you so much. Oh, no. Very welcome, man. Very welcome. <sighs> Wow. How you feeling, man? I mean, you just ran a marathon. I ran my second marathon on Sunday, and this book just came out. So yep. I'm, I'm tired, but I'm happy to be here. This is the book he's talking about, The Education of Kevin Powell, A Boy's Journey into Manhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you asked me to, uh, to read something. Yes. Um, I would like for him to read the intro to the book. I think uh, when he hit me with it, I didn't know that the book was going to start off uh, so abrasive. And as you guys could tell, you know, um, in a minute, he'll be able to let you feel it, too. I mean, let, let me say this first. I want to thank Apple. I want to thank Day Tuan. I want DJ Herbert Holler. Let's give him a round of applause. That's my yeah. man for that great set. Um, and uh, just thank you all for being here. You know, uh, as I said at Day Tuan and other people, this is the hardest book I've ever read, wrote in my life. This is actually harder than even things I did, you know, back in the day at Vibe, you know, recent stuff, because uh, it's, it's real personal. You know, but definitely hip hop is uh, hip hop is such a big part. Of, I mean, hip hop is my life. I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for hip hop. I grew up a b boy, graffiti writer. Um, you know, and uh, a lot of the energy of this book is very much of our culture. This is the introduction intro. Fist pounding my face from every angle. I'm so stupid for coming out into this hallway. I thought I should have known they'd be out here waiting for me. I wanted to scream, but I resolved to take the beating as punishment for my life. As the blows torpedoed my nose, my eye sockets, my temples, and my ears, my mind staggered toward the possibility that I could die. And I imagined the damage, the deviated septum, the detached retina, and the loss of vision, the loudness of sudden deafness, garbled speech. I saw my body days later, swollen, with lumpy clots around the gashes, being found in a park, decomposed, and fed, up, fed up upon by bloated fanged street rats. My mother would come to the hospital to identify and scream the kind of cry every ghetto mother saves for the day when it is her son who has died prematurely. I could hear my mother's anguished voice. Lord, I knew he would end up this way. He was always walking the wrong path. Dang, what a way to go out, beat down by some pissed off black men. I wasn't with that. I squirmed and ducked my head, ducked head blows to fold my bony frame, bony frame into a ball the way they taught me in that uh, Jersey City PL karate class but the kicks and brunches blasted through anyway. Blood, thick, bitter clumps of it oozed between my teeth and gums. My eyes had swollen into puffy balloons so I couldn't make out the faces through the slits, but the voices sounded familiar. We should kill this kid for that ish. Man, later for that, I ain't trying to get no murder rap. Stop being a punk, yo, who gonna tell? I wanted to say to those voices, yo brothers, don't you know who I am? I'm that kid from around the way. But they could, could, could not have cared less. I was just another black boy who had played the wrong game and needed a good kicking, butt kicking. Once the men had planted me solidly on the tile floor, I faked like I was out cold, hoping to get some mercy. Get up, boy, you ain't dead yet. Sturdy, leathery, leathery hands yanked me by my feet, and I was dragged down the hallway stairs, out of the building, into the parking lot next door. An electric light current jolted my body, and I could feel my flesh frying atop the friction and heat of the pavement. Does anyone see any of this? I thought as heavy shoes and work boots pummeled my chest and rib cage. For the first time, I bawled loud and long like an abandoned baby. Ah, these dudes are going to kill me, yo. Flat on my back, I cupped the night's pitch blackness in my outstretched hands, and I prayed silently, and I wondered if I was going to heaven or hell. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
my mother told me to say whenever I was in deep trouble. Maybe I had used up too many prayers, but the men, reeking of alcohol and now exhausted, hurled their legs and arms into me a few more times, then floated backwards to admire their work. As they turned away, I could hear them smacking palms in each other's backs, muttering, dang, we beat that kid down. So that's the introduction to the book. Woo. And uh, <laughs> he did. You asked me why I started there. It really happened when I was mad young. Um, and you know, I'm from the hood and things happen. You know, I was caught up in some stuff. I don't really detail what it is. I don't exactly. even say where it's at. But I think anybody who grew up where I came from, you know, you always walking around with the possibility that you can get jumped, you can get stabbed, you can get shot. It's just mad real like that. And you know, uh, when y'all read the whole book and you see the kind of stuff that I go through, I just, I just want folks to understand this is not an easy existence for us. You know what I'm saying? And, um, um, and I remember as a, as, a, as a college student back in the day reading Richard Wright, uh, Richard Wright's native son, and how the book started with Bigger Thomas, the main character, trying to kill a big rat. You know, and how that was jarring to me, like, man, because I grew up in that environment, you know right. what I'm saying? And so I said, what could I do? How could I start this book? And I thought about that scene, uh, which I had written a long time ago. I had never done anything with it. I said, let me make this the opening scene of the book. So that's how it started yeah. there. And it's crazy because uh, I'm not giving too much away, but you don't necessarily re even revisit nah. like, what happened. Nah. Why was it important for you to start off the book that way? Man, that was a traumatic experience, and I wanted to get it off my chest. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I just, you know... But also, you know, given what's happening in this country, this could be any period, you know? Yep. This could be, you know, black on black crime, it could be the police, racial profiling, I mean, violence is violence, and we have to deal with it, unfortunately. You know, and I, I just feel very lucky that I survived that, because I really thought I was gonna get killed that night, to be honest with you, Right. you know what I'm saying? I remember um, throughout the process of you writing a book, we would talk yeah. here and there, we would have calls and everything, and you were saying that, of course, it was the, hardest thing you've ever had to write. Yeah. But we were also talking about exposing truth yeah. and how much, and I was asking you, like, okay, how are you approaching upsetting some people that you're naming in the book in certain situations? I changed some of the names. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, um, you know what? I, I just think that uh, you have to tell the truth. As a, as a writer, as an artist, you have to tell your truth. And um, for me, what was most important is that there's a lot of stuff that I just wanted to get off my chest, you know, um, surviving, growing up in inner city, surviving poverty, surviving uh, my mom's raising me by herself on welfare and food stamps, surviving my father abandoning me at eight years of age, you know, uh, not thinking I was going to make it to 15, not thinking I was going to make it to 18 to 21, going to college because of a financial aid package, getting kicked out of college, never finishing college. You know, there's so many different things. Ending up at Vibe magazine, ending up on MTV. I mean, I couldn't even imagine all that stuff happening. You know, but the one thing that kept kept me going was my mother always said to me, "You got to work. You got to work hard." Um, and and you know, um, and I, at some point, the dream that I could be a writer was developed, which I talk about in the book because right. of my mother taking me to the library. Uh, and I just at the when I was writing the book. The book is written from love, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's written from position of love. That's what I always say to people uh, in healing. And I'm not interested in dissing people or disrespecting people. I'm just telling the story. How some people may take it is up to them. But you know, for me, where it was sensitive, I made sure to change some names. Just like when we was at Vibe Magazine back in the day, you know, y'all remember when Tupac got shot the first time, right? And we did this, faint, this cover story with, from Rikers Island, the interview with Tupac, and Pac named everybody, and we changed the names. We was like, you know, we need to change these names for legal reasons and for your safety, to be honest with you. And, you know, I don't know if you really want to call people out like that. And Pac didn't really understand that, because I remember he said to me, you changed the names, man. So, man, we, we had to change those names. And, you know, but at the end of the day, this is my story, and I believe that you should tell your story no matter what and not be afraid of putting it out there, you know? Right. Now, you have, um, this is your 11th. 12, 12, 12 books. 12 books. You have yeah. 11 previous books. Yeah. Why did it take that long for you to be able to get this one out? Because <laughs> the, the first one, uh, who's going to take the weight? That wasn't the first one. It was right. A, no, no that, was, that was one of my essay books. Okay. The first thing I ever did was uh, an anthology called In the Tradition. In the uh, tradition. Just like, can we give it up for Taylor Johnson again, too, the poet? Oh, Taylor. You know, um, back in the 90s, um, my generation, myself, Asha Bendeli, Tony Medina, 
Uh, Raz Barak, who's now the mayor of North New Jersey. Some of y'all may know Raz. He's the teacher that, whose voice you hear on Lauren Hill's Miss Education, Lauren Hill. Um, uh, we all were young poets coming up in this scene, Willie Padermo, people like that. Um, and so we put together an anthology of young black writers. And I just was really, you know, uh, as I was saying to tale earlier today, I just wanted to uh, be out there grinding as a writer early. Right. And we realized if you want to have opportunities, you got to create those opportunities, you know. Um, but in the 90s, actually when I was at Vibe Magazine, I got offered a book deal to write that book, you know, wow. but I was in my 20s and I was like, you know what, if I write this book now, it's going to be mad angry. I'm going to be angry <laughs> at my mom. So I'm going to be angry at my father. Right. It's, I'm, be, I'm just going to, it's going to be a, it's, you know, you got to live a little bit, you know what I'm saying? But you knew that then. I knew that then. Yeah. You know, I did. And it's interesting because I just saw Stevie Wonder uh, perform in Songs in the Key of Life. As some of y'all know, he's doing a tour around the country. This is the last time he's going to do it. I didn't realize that that's his 18th album, Songs in the Key of Life, which is considered one of the masterpieces. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? And so I believe that as an artist, as a creative person, you actually need to live a little bit, experience some things, and the hope is that you'll grow into, you know, a book like that, which I hope people, I mean, the responses have been incredible. I mean, the Beach Boys didn't just put out Pet Sounds, they had to grow to Pet Sounds. Right. You know, the Beatles didn't just put out Sgt. Pepper, they had to grow to that, you know what I mean? And, and that's what I think about. You know, even like I look at Kendrick Lamar, but he's, people who are just discovering Kendrick Lamar now, you know, to pimp a butterfly, Kendrick has been out there for a minute, yeah. developing as an artist, you Section know what I'm saying? 80 exactly. And everything, yeah, going You know, on, I, I see, you know, uh, and uh, those of us in the music industry who are or hip hop heads know you gotta, you gotta, uh, this is not easy, man. You right. Know, you know, um, especially writing in these times is very different than writing when. You were coming in. It's very different, man. Yeah. When we were, when we you just asked for some whiteout back there, I know. they was looking at you like, yo, whiteout. What's whiteout? <laughs> you know. What he I'm was saying? like, yo, I need some whiteout, man. And they found it too. Shout out to Which, the Apple I was, I was worried. <laughs> My man P over there. Pablo, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but you know, it's funny you said because when I when we started when we started Vibe Magazine back in the day, uh, they said to us that we we're going to be like the you know the hip hop version of the New Yorker magazine or Vanity Fair. The articles were like six, seven thousand words long. Incredible. You know what I mean? But we yeah. didn't have all these gadgets that we have now. I got my iPhone. I mean, it's like you know, you know how it is now. People want three hundred words, five hundred words. We want photos. You know what I'm saying? It's shifted. And so even as I was writing this book, I said to myself, you know what? Let me have mad chapters. Some of the chapters are kind of long, but it's like I wanted to keep the language as simple as possible to reach as many people as possible. Not that people are not intelligent, but you got to you got to transition with the times. You know, because I'm thinking to myself, some folks are going to share this stuff on Instagram. They're going to share it on Twitter. They're going to share parts of it on Facebook. And I thought about that as, as I was writing it. You know what I mean? Now, when you were doing it, was there a particular chapter that was like really tough to write. I know there's the, the part with your dad that yeah. was really tough when you get into that part. There's also your time in college where you were like really confused and going through a lot. Yeah, you had like lawsuits and different kind of things. I was wild, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And out of control in a lot of ways, you know. Um, honestly, the hardest chapters were the childhood chapters, you know, um, reliving that poverty, you know what I'm saying? Reliving, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, Daytuan, like even today, like if I see something black out of the corner of my eyes, I think about the rats that we grew up with, literally like family members. You know, a brother uh, asked me before the program started, he said he's doing something on poverty. Am I right, sir? You're doing something on poverty. Poverty messes up your psyche, man. You know what I mean? It should not be normal that you, you know, you, you I mean, we kids in the hood playing with roaches. They like our friends, our family mm -hmm. members, you know what I'm saying? You know, like you try, my mom's going to the corner grocery store, you know, getting a dollar's worth of bologna and that's got to last us the whole week. You know what I mean? And I actually cried a lot reading, writing parts of the book because I had to relive all of that, man, and how hard it was for me and my mother. Um, Did and you block a lot of that out as you got older? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. You know, um, in some ways, yeah. In some ways, I talked about it, but, um, you know, it, it's deep, man. So, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, I know I have friends now, man, who, like, even if they're not poor anymore, they'll go somewhere. You know, and they'll just take some stuff and, you know, like we said we go to an industry event, you know, they'll just like take some stuff, I'm going to take this with me and put it in my pocket, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> just in case I get hungry later. Y'all industry folks know what I'm talking about. The free stuff. Yeah. And some of y'all travel with Tupperware, aluminum foil. <laughs> <laughs> But that's how it was. Like I remember being in the and when we when when I was at MTV and Vibe coming up in the '90s, we, me and my boy would go to industry events. We were like, yo, let's eat as much stuff as possible. Right. You know what I mean? Because you have those memories of when you didn't have any food yeah. on a on a consistent basis. Where you know if you didn't eat what you had in front of you, you really weren't eating. You know what I'm saying? And you were lucky that you had that meal. And so that was hard, man. To uh, that and the and the uh, 
finding out about my father, which is the last chapter of the book, Finding My Father. Uh, for those who haven't read the book yet, I literally uh, searched for two years and found him and his family in the last couple of years. I don't want to tell you what happened, but it's uh, incredible. Though. It was deep. You know what I mean? Because it's like I found, finally figured out half of who I was all these years. I didn't know half of my life, half of my family. You know what I mean? And it, it hit me hard. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a theme throughout the book as well. There's, um, there's some hints of anger. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of anger. There's some hints. You're being but, very polite. <laughs> from going through, you know, uh, your youth at school. Yeah. Uh, grade school. Then in college. Then at different places of, of your uh, employment. Yeah. You saw a recurring theme. Why, why was the anger there? What, what was going on with you? I mean, you know, um, there was anger, there's violence, there was abuse on both, from all angles, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I was traumatized, man. I was in pain, I was hurting. I mean, one of the things that we don't talk about in our communities is how many of us have been traumatized in our lives. You know, some of us, it might have been physical abuse or violence, it might have been mental abuse or violence, you know. Um, and, you know, a lot of times our, our families are doing the best they could or the environment around us, but people are taking it out on each other, you know, and hurting right. each other. And, you know, um, I talk about the things that were said to me as a child that damaged and uh, really damaged my self-esteem. Uh, and I was one of those kids. If I was a kid today, they would probably put, try to put me on drugs. They would yep. probably put me in special education. In fact, they tried to do that when I was a kid, but my mother would fight that. Like, no, he's a, he's a, he's a smart kid. He's a good student. How are you gonna try to put him in the special, the special class? Because they would say that I had, we had behavioral problems, like they say about a lot of uh, young kids, especially from urban environments, you know? Um, and then I had the hurt of my father abandoning us, you know? I, my mother and father were never married, as I talk about in the book. But, you know, I saw him two or three times in my life until, up until I was eight years old. He bought me my first watch, my first bicycle. You know, he wasn't really there. I never called him dad or father or pop or anything. We called him by his last name, right. you know, because he wasn't really, I didn't really know what a father was, you know what I mean? My mother was my father. They'd be real, real about it, you know? And then, you know, at eight years old, we were so poor, as I told him in the book, we didn't even have a telephone in the house. Things we take for granted. And so we'd actually have to, me and my mother had to go around the corner to the drugstore, use a payphone. Remember those things, payphones? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? There was no iPhones Crazy. back then, you know what I mean? <laughs> and she called my father, and he, um, he basically said, you know what? You lied to me. He, he ain't my son. I'm not going to give you a near nickel for him ever again. And he hung up the phone my mother. Never heard from him again, you know? That affects you. That makes you angry. You blame yourself. You blame your mother. You, you know, uh, you blame yourself. You, you're angry about the conditions that you live in. Why, are we in. why are we in the hood? Why are we suffering like this? Right. I was angry at the churches that we went to because they was taking our money. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? All of those, y'all know what I'm talking about. You yeah. know what I mean? All the hustlers in the community. And so, and you know, there was no outlet for that. And so you act out, man. And you know, people think because you went to college, or you ended up on MTV, or you're at Vibe Magazine, and all these things are happening because you might have a little bit of talent, that doesn't mean that you've healed from all the stuff that you've been through. Look at all the artists who are successful artists who've had all kinds of problems. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So. Now, taking that and, and uh, being kind of drafted into the MTV realm, you're, huh. you're pretty much the icon for angry black male in reality TV. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. I mean, when but I used to watch the show, I used to be like, yo, I want to see what this dude going to do this week. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see what he going to do. Um, I'm so peaceful and loving now. Though. Yeah, especially now. But what was that time like, and, and how did that whole thing come together with MTV in the real world? Well, you know what? It's interesting because um, this is the early 90s. And that was actually the same year that Quincy Jones partnered with Vibe Magazine and started, uh, started with Time Warner started Vibe Magazine. I was already a writer. I was a writer. I was doing my thing. I was grinding as a freelance writer. And so I'm writing news reports, news articles. I started writing music stuff, you know. In fact, the first music piece that I ever wrote uh, was about Intelligent Hoodlum, Hoodlum from wow. Queens. Tragedy. Trag. Trag, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I also used to write bios for different artists. I wrote Usher's first bio. I used to interview Coach Criss Cross, you know what I mean? I wrote a bio for TLC. We were, we were just trying to make money any way we could. And I was actually with um, Chrissy Murray, who was a publicist at Sony Records, at, at Columbia Records at the time. I remember Chrissy. They had a group, yeah. she was representing a group called Joe Public from Buffalo. I don't know if you remember Joe Public. They, um, they, these dudes had little twisties, how we used to wear our hair twisties after we had the flat top phase. <laughs> And they played instruments, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, I wrote their bio. We were hanging out at a, a, a restaurant in Midtown Manhattan called Stardust Cafe. And we, we went in there, and I had on my overalls. Because if you look at pictures how we dressed in the 90s, yeah, everything was crazy. baggy. Everything was mad baggy, Super you know what I'm baggy. saying? 
And this woman came up to us named Tracy Fist, and she said, yo, I, your look is, I don't know who y'all are, because she thought we all was just, you know. She thought you was part, part of the group. Or ho we're just homies hanging out together. Uh -huh. And she said, um, you know, we're doing this show for MTV called The Real World. Would any of y'all be interested? They were like, well, we're a group. And I took the card, and I said, ah, OK. <laughs> MTV, but all you notice he took the car, right? Yeah, <laughs> because for two reasons. One, I knew about Yo MTV Raps, the hip hop mm -hmm. thing, and then I remember that MTV at a point didn't want to play Michael Jackson's video, so I thought about that. I was like, okay, let me. But, but what I thought about was like, if I end up in this show, whatever it's going to be, maybe I can get some speaking gigs at some colleges. Uh, That's all I thought about. He's thinking of the hustle. Because I had gone to college with Sister Soldier, you know, and part of the work that I did around the hip hop community, Soldier was working with KRS One and Chuck D, and she was a dynamic speaker. And I remember every time she was on TV, she got speaking gigs. And I was like, I can get paid off of this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We had no idea it was going to turn into what it became. And even as we were filming the show, which literally y'all, was down the block from here. One block. Wow. Down, the one, apartment. The apartment building is right at the corner on Broadway and uh, Prince. Uh -huh. And imagine, you know, I was living up in Harlem at the time, you know what I mean? And, you know, with a roommate yeah. and broke, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and um, here we are. And it didn't really hit us until after the show aired. When we, I remember walking down Broadway and all of a sudden I heard some footsteps, people like running behind you, you know? And I remember they, MTV flew us out to the Video Music Awards. And this is to put it in context, this is the same year. Nirvana, Red Hot Chili Peppers, you know what I mean? Howard Stern had blown up as a radio personality. The seven of us showed up, and people screamed for us like we were the Beatles. Crazy. It was bananas. The power of TV. And that same month that the VMAs happened, the first cover story of, of Vibe Magazine, I did a cover story on Tretch, Naughty by Nature. You feel what I'm saying? And so it was um, a mind-boggling year, to say the least. But nothing really prepares you as a young person you know, to experience that kind of exposure, which I also talk about in the book, because I think you can't just talk about, well, you know, you did these cover stories, you were on MTV, but you got to talk about the lows. There was right. depression, there was, you know, a ba battles with alcohol at a certain point. I didn't even grow up with liquor in my household, but nothing prepares you for that, because as you, as you talk about, I had all those cover stories, but then I got fired from Vibe a few years later, and the same time, year I got fired from Vibe, a few months later, Tupac Shakur gets killed. Six months later, Biggie Small gets killed. We were in the middle of all of that, so that affected me deeply. Of course. You know what I mean? To see all the bullets flying at the time. We didn't know where these bullets were coming from. All this madness around East Coast, West Coast. People blaming the media for creating this stuff. And we, at least myself, we were... Did you feel like you were taking some of the heat for that? Oh, yeah. Oh, for yeah. That? If people go back and look at the Death Row story, if y'all really read the Death Row cover story that had Suge, Tupac, Snoop, the and Dre on the cover... Yeah. Actually, I actually, I purposely put in the article at the end we need to deal with this because something's going to happen. Read the article, you know what I mean? Because I, people, what people don't realize... Is I was, that because you were entrenched in that whole thing with Suge and all of them? You felt that energy more so? I felt or? that energy, but also because I was an activist. Gotcha. Going back to my days in college with Sister Soldier, the reason why I was interested in Tupac Shakur in the first place wasn't so much because he was a, a great rapper or anything like that. It's because who his mother was, Afeni Shakur, the Black Panther Party coming out of the Civil Rights Movement. I knew that Tupac was a different kind of dude. People didn't realize or don't realize how important she was to the movement. Exactly. Like how high up exactly. she was in the Black Panther exactly. Party. And exactly. And where a lot of his passion came from. I mean, his name. That. You wouldn't have a name like Tupac Amor Shakur if you didn't have a mother or a parent who actually was conscious about because of the movement and wanted right. to give their kid a name that meant something. You know what I'm saying? And so it was all that energy, man. Because I knew that this was like classic divide and conquer. This was, this was tribal warfare. This is the kind of stuff people wanted to see happen to understand undermine hip-hop you know mm -hmm. it got it had people petro of going from one coast to east co other coast and what i remember saying at the time we don't own the east coast we don't own the west coast you don't own this project i don't own that project you don't own this block i don't own that block it's just insanity you see it to this day when people are fighting over stuff it's a it's a classic slave mentality man but what's crazy is that when you talk about you did two covers with pop three covers three covers and then the death row cover was the and fourth the death row. yeah um when he asked for you to be the one that interviewed him in jail that was a different guy yeah. than when you saw him come out. Yeah. And that you even saw it go in. So you, you saw kind of like three different Pots? <laughs> if, if, it's if, it's, so it's interesting. When I, met, when I met Pac, if anyone remembers, uh, in the 90s, there was this music conference called Jack the Rapper. Yeah. You know, um, and let me go back, because I talk about it in the book, in that chapter called Vibe Magazine and Two Five and Tupac. I, um, I, um, said to the folks at Vibe Magazine, you know, they asked myself and the other staff writers, well, who do you want to interview? 
after and after the, the Tretch cover story was a big seller, they start, they really started the magazine. Everybody said who they wanted to do, and I said, well, I want to. This is dude named Tupac Shakur, who I'm interested in, you know. And the and the response was kind of lukewarm, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And I was just like, okay. And this is after Pac was in Juice, you know. This is after his uh, first album, and I was listening to his lyrics in a very different kind of way. I was like, his lyrics reminded me of like N.W.A. over here, but then it's like Public Enemy over here. You feel what I'm saying? It was like it was, he was able to talk to a wide range of people, you know. And I never thought Pac was the greatest rapper in the world, but it was what he was saying, the vulnerability, you know what I mean? It's it's like like, who talks like that? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's kind of like why I think people are responding to Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar is making music today talking about, he, you know, he's battling depression. You yeah. know what I mean? Making songs about loving himself. That's, that's the kind of stuff that intrigued me about Pac. Whatever he felt, he just said. You know what right. I mean? Which is, to me, the way we should be. Um, you know, they uh, were not interested, that interested, and so I ended up doing a cover story on Snoop Dogg, because Snoop was the biggest rapper. This is right around the time of The Chronic, right? And Snoop had really dominated The Chronic album, and his new album, was his first solo album was coming out. So I did that, but I kept all my notes on Tupac. I was like, I'm going to do Tupac Shakur sooner or later. Right. I went to Jack the Rapper. I was with a, my friend Carla Radford, who had been, Carla, a, spe who had been a special visitor director at Vibe. Yep. At the time, she was the assistant to Keith Klingscales, who's now running Revolt for, uh, for Diddy. And so me and Carla were Jack the Rapper in a hotel lobby. We saw Pac and mad people around Tupac and just kind of like, you know, they were, they were sweating him. You know what I'm saying? And so I was like, I'm not going over there. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not this I'm dude. I'm not going to be in yeah, all that crazy. Nah. But Carla, being how bold she is, you know how yep. Carla is, she went over to Pac. She went right through the circle and tapped on the shoulder like, yo, Pac, you need to talk to Kevin Powell over there because he needs to do an interview with you. Pac spins around and he's like, yo, that's you my man from MTV. I had your back on that show, dude. <laughs> and it bugged me out. You know what I'm saying? So here I was, a fan of his, and he was and a he, fan of mine. Right. And that's how the whole thing started. And I got to give a shout out to Karen Lee, uh, a great publicist who used to be Prince's publicist. She was Pac's publicist. Now she's uh, Chris Paul's publicist from the LA Clippers, and she's also Chris Brown's uh, Chris Paul's publicist and Chris Brown's publicist now, but she, uh, she helped to make a lot of that stuff happen. And Karen Lee uh, also is from my hometown in Jersey City, from Chilltown. And um, one thing Pac said to me, you know, is that I want you to be Alex Haley to my Malcolm X. It's almost like he didn't know he was going to live a long time. Right. He's like, I want to tell my story to someone. I'm going to trust you with this story, which was deep. And I remember in my head thinking, the activist in me was like, well, what if I want to be Malcolm X? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But he, um, he was about just putting it out there, man. And so, you know, when the Rikers Island thing happened, you know, we were the only people that he talked to. You know what I'm right. saying? And what was it, you know, just to deep dive a little bit more with Pac, what was it like seeing him in that state? <sighs> you know, I mean, Pac never had a chance, in my opinion, man, because life was moving so fast around him. You know, I mean, y'all got to think about it. He only lived at 25. He only lived at 25. 25 is young. It's crazy. It's mad young. You know what I mean? Um, uh, and think about it. Pac was born in New York, you know, he spent years in Baltimore, Baltimore School of the Performing Arts, and then he's out in, current, in the Marin County in, 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 in uh, uh, Northern California. Um, his mother, as he talks about honestly, and she talks about honestly, he ended, she ended up, you know, having a crack epi uh, uh, addiction. You know, Pac was just out there, man, and so he, you know, music, and some know, people know he was dancing first. He was a roadie for Digital Underground. He was a dancer, you know, and he was always about family, community. So, you know, anyone who makes it, you know, you're not just taking care of yourself. You're taking care of the people around you. You're responsible for all these different people. And then on top of that, Pac was conscious. So he realized, even as a young person, because of where he came from, his mother, and that whole history of, of, of activism, that he represented something for a lot of people. It was Pac who said to me, you know, you know, me and Snoop, we sell five, six million records. That's five, six million voters. Imagine what we can do with this army of young people. So he knew all of that, you know, and... Um, where do you think he would be right now if he was here, if, if he was talking like that then? Because a lot of people, they really haven't given him the biggest future is saying like, oh, he would have been this, he would have been that. What do you think, just from his personality? I'm gonna say a name that you, some of you, I hope y'all know, but I would, some of y'all may know, Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. Paul Robeson. That's what Pac, for those who don't know, Paul Robeson was a dynamic singer, classically trained actor, a great football player, you know, all-American athlete. He went to my school, Rutgers University. But it, most importantly, he was a spokesperson for, for the, 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 the oppressed on this planet of all different races, that's Pac. Mm -hmm. You know, if you just listen to the lyrics to keep your head up and you hear him talking about poverty, you know what I mean? He's talking about, you know, being pro-choice. You know, we don't have the right to tell a woman what to do with her body. I mean, it's all kinds of stuff that he was grappling with. And I think, I think Pac would have been a dynamic actor. I think he was actually a greater actor than he was a, a, a rapper. You know, when you look at the, if y'all look at the performance in Juice, 
because the other movies were cool, but Juice was chilling. You know what right. I mean? I mean, that's what got me. I remember seeing it uptown in Harlem, and I was just like, who's this dude? You know what I mean? Who's this dude that's just transforming himself in this role like this? And, um, you know, uh, but he, unfortunately, what happens with a lot of us, we got people around us, and I'm saying everybody, but, you know, I feel like Pac, like a lot of us, was looking for a father figure the whole time. Right. You know what I'm saying? Looking for love the whole time, you know what I mean? And then when you get into the music industry, to the entertainment industry, you know, and I've been in it for 25 years, y'all, so I can say it. The entertainment industry, as much as I love it, as much as I've benefited from it, it's not really about your development. You got to really be about your own development. You have to make sure that you put the markers in to carry yourself to the next level. Exactly. When y'all read my book, you'll see what happened to me post-vibe. It's not pretty. It's not pretty at all, you know? And that happens to a lot of us, unfortunately. And I feel like it happened to Pac, you know? But it was deep to me, Daytuan, is like, I never thought that I can go to Ireland. I can go somewhere in the West Indies. You know, I right. can be in Japan. Wherever I go, people have read these Vibe magazine articles, and they'll say, Tupac is my hero. He's this global icon. Yes. You know, it's like he's, his stature has grown and grown and grown. But a lot of that came, if you, if you take away the music, and yeah. you take away the movies, then it's really, you're left with your interviews. Yeah. Wow. You know, you're really left with being able to see a young man at that time going through it through your words. And at the same time, you're going through it. Yeah. And he's an activist, and then you end up finding your way into activism as well. Like, how did how did that happen? Well, I mean, I was like I said, I was an activist before I got to Vibe and all that stuff, man. Um, you know, um, and that's, that's I think that's why we connected because a lot of the conversations, you know, it's it's funny, man. You know, years a few years back, I did an interview with Dave Chappelle, who has the same background. People don't realize Esquire. Esquire magazine cover uh -huh. story. People don't realize Dave Chappelle's mother, for example, is one of the pioneers around black studies in this country. You know what I'm saying? She's an activist, and he comes from a family. Chappelle's talked about it, where everybody in his family went to, went to college. You know, these are scholars. You know, you want to know why Dave is such a brilliant comedian and some of the stuff he says? Look at his background. You want to know why Top Tupac was making songs like Life Goes On and, you know, Keep Your Head Up and, and the lyrics, the stuff that he's saying? Look at his background. You know what I'm saying? Matulo Shakur was his stepfather. This is a political prisoner in this country. And so you got the, you know, you got all that shaping you. You're going to be affected by it. So I had my background as an activist and writer. Pac had his background as a rapper who came from an activist spirit. It was almost like a, uh, it was almost like the universe brought us together to, to, to document this stuff. You know what I'm right. saying? And you're right. I remember being in Barbados in the West Indies years ago, hanging out and just ch kicking it with some heads. And, and um, word got around that Kevin Powell, the writer from the States, was there. A young brother came out with a Tupac shirt on. He said, yo, you don't understand. When I was in jail in Barbados, I actually read your articles on Tupac, and that actually saved my life. It wow. blew my mind. Well, what is it like when you, um, and I'm sure that's not the only time people have said that. I've come to you and tell, told yeah. you about pieces that yeah. have affected me and made me want to write. What's that like knowing that every time you're about to put your words out, that someone is going to be affected in a different type of way? Oh, well, you know, let me say this. First of all, trust me, I've written a lot of stuff that's been terrible that has sucked. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because not everything you write is, um, that's real. you know, uh, good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, you just hope as an artist, as an artist, if you create music, shout out to AZ, you know what I'm saying? If you create music, if you create art in any form of film, you know, uh, you just got to keep doing the work. You know what I mean? And hope that something touches somebody. You know what I mean? Um, the way I feel about this book that you're holding in your hand is the way I feel about the stuff that I wrote at Vibe 20 years ago. It's the first time I felt this strongly about something like, this is, this is it. You know what I mean? Because it's coming from it's coming from a place that I had back then that got got killed that died for a while, which was I actually loved what I was doing. There was years where I didn't even love what I was doing. I was just putting out books, you know, because I, I felt like that's what I was supposed to do. You know what I mean? Where it, it, and that's not the way to create art. You got to do it because it's as important to you as breathing. You know what I mean? And and I think that you know when you talk about artists, you know, not just Tupac, but I love. You know, I love Bob Marley, I love Marvin Gaye, I love Lauryn Hill, you know what I'm saying? I love Kendrick Lamar, you know, I love Laura Nero, you know what I'm saying? I love, I love Amy Winehouse, you know, that document, Nina Simone. I gravitate toward the artists that have really had an effect on my, on my spirit, on my soul, you know? Uh, the poetry of Sonia Sanchez, of Amiri Baraka, the beat generation poets like Allen Ginsberg, you, you feel what I'm saying? And I think that's really the point of art. Like, you know, you create it for yourself, but if you give yourself uh, uh, unconditionally to the art, it's going to touch people. Right. You know what I mean? I told Tretch, if I can just say this, um, people always focus on Naughty by Nature's uh, OPP song, because that was the big hit. You know what I mean? But the song that actually got me interested in Naughty by Nature was Everything's Gonna Be Alright, when he said, never knew my dad. 
You know what mm -hmm. I mean? As crazy as my sound, I had never heard it said like that on a record. But and then he then he goes in, mother after, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So he's <laughs> well, he was speaking for me at that time. I wouldn't say it like that now because right. I'm not going to you know, put homophobic language out there at the time. I was like, word, he's speaking for me. But then when you think about now, that same song is kind of Kendrick's All Right. That's right. And it's the reason why at the anniversary of Million Man March, you had all those young black men walking around saying, singing Kendrick's song. You know what I mean? Right. Because it's, it resonates with them. But the, I think one of the biggest differences between then and now is an artist like Tretch who could be seen as like the super thug or right. whatever the case may be, can make a, can also make a song like that and given the leeway to make that song. Yeah. Whereas it now, if you make something, you're just young thug right. only. And right. if he wants to step out, he can't because you're only here. But that's an interesting point because I feel like, you know, Bobito Garcia, who used to work at Vibe as well, you know, Bob is my man, you know, all of our, I mean, it's one of our, our great hip hop, uh, man, everything. Yeah, DJs, historians. writers, historians, yeah. you know what I mean, filmmakers. You know, Bob Beatles, his point was like, the problem isn't the music that's out today, the problem is the lack of balance. You know what I mean? And I think that's why everybody's been gravitating towards Kendrick Lamar, because you can, you're hearing all this diverse, I mean, think about it. First of all, he used live musicians on To Pimp a Butterfly, you know, which is dope. You know, I did an interview today with uh, the Daily News, and they were asking me, I didn't realize this, maybe y'all knew this, um, Wu-Tang Clan's debut album and Tribe Called Quest Midnight Marauders came out on the same, same day, day in 1993. Yep. Think about that for a second. Yep. Think about the diversity in hip hop just by those two albums. You know what I'm saying? And then think about the, the, the people who make up Wu Tang Clan. You know what I mean? You know, when you, when you hear, you know, you think about the different artists. I mean, ODB was my man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, you know, people think I would gravitate to one of the other members of Wu Tang, but I just, ODB was just raw, like his song. You know what I'm saying? But I also love Tribe Called Quest with, with Fife represented, with, with Tip represented. And I don't know if they would get signed today. I don't know. You know what I'm I saying? I really don't. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sad. Real quick, before we get to the Q&A portion, what was the inspiration just throughout your career to keep going? Because there are so many times, even in the book, you talk about being beat down, yeah. you know, through life, through career, yeah. um, physically, you're, you're back on your health kick. Yeah. What was the inspiration on just keeping going? Wow, that's a great question. You just, uh, Chuck D, let's bring it back to hip hop. Chuck D said it in Welcome to, to the Terror Dome, refuse to lose. Refuse mm. to lose. You know, Dave Chappelle says something I always re I remember. If you want any inspiration in life, you, want, you need a quote, you just got to turn to a hip-hop song. There's wow. something somewhere, in, in so, even, even the grimiest, most un apolitical hip-hop song, there's, a, there's at least one line in there that's going to grab you. You so know, um, Lupe Fiasco's song, The Show Goes On. That's me, man. When I was writing that book, I probably played That Show Goes, show goes On more than any other song. Really? I love The Show Goes On. I mean, he's talking to me. You know what I mean? It's... it's, it's, it's it's, and you just, you just, I'm like, if my mother can survive with an eighth grade, grade school education in the kind of poverty she survived in, raising a child by herself, I can't give up. My grandmother couldn't read or write, you know what I'm saying? My great-grandfather, I found out as an adult, had been killed in the South because he had 400 acres of land, and some of the racist white men in the community wanted the land, and he refused to give it up, so they just killed them and then took the land. And so how can I give up when they've survived all of that? You feel what I'm saying? How can I give up when you see what's happened to brothers and sisters in places like Haiti, you know what I'm saying? You know, literally, uh, uh, you know, surviving all kinds of things since their great revolution over 200 years ago. It's almost like people got a grudge against Haiti, you know what I mean? I, I can't give up, man. I think about all the people out there, uh, men, women, young people, old people, who have, uh, against great odds, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Against great odds, you know, uh, even if we're in the midst of poverty, they still find some hope, they find some happiness, they got Something's faith. Something's there for them. You know, even though I don't, I, I, I go to church, I got a lot of problems with so-called organized religion, I can't deny the power of faith. I'm like, these people still believe in spite of everything that they've been through. So real. You know what I mean? And so that's what keeps me going, man. Like, if I give up, I'm not just giving up for myself. I also realize, and you know this, Daytuan, because you're a leader, you're a role model. People are watching you, man. And mm -hmm. so if you give up, then that, that doesn't give them any hope. Like, well, if he gave up, then I should give up. You know, and when I was going through the stuff after Vibe in the book, you know, I really, it was bad, y'all. I would walk around with a hoodie on my head all the time. I didn't want to be seen. My baseball cap was pulled low. You know, I felt like a failure. You know, I felt like I had let a lot of people down. And the worst thing we can do is just allow uh, our self-esteem to just get so low, man, you know, that we just, you may not be dead literally, but it's almost like slow suicide. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. And, you know, we got to bounce back. And, you know, what keeps me going, man, 
Taylor Johnson, young people, you know what I'm saying? All the young people I meet, you know, young people who come up to me who weren't even born when Tupac was alive, like, yo, I read the article, I read something that you wrote, you know what I mean? It's, it's surreal, man, you know, and you, you don't take that for granted. What keeps me going as an activist is that we still have a world that has racism and sexism and classism, homophobia, uh, hatred of people because they're disabled or, you know, all this religious strife. We got to fight against that. What keeps me going? We got to have peace and love on this planet, and that's what I want to see. And it took me a long time to understand that, but that's, that's why I'm rolling now. And I definitely represent, you know, my community, Brooklyn, you know what I'm saying, Jersey City. I represent poor people. I work, represent working class people. Uh, I got to represent for them because I realized I've been blessed to have some opportunities. Man, a lot of my homies didn't even make it out the crack era, man. It's crazy. You, you feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I'm, work, I'm working. Right. That's what keeps me going. You got to get even up. with BK Nation. Our organization, BK Nation, it stands for Building Knowledge. It's like, let's help people. And, and no matter what y'all do in your lives, whatever your career is, do something to help someone else. It can't just be about you. That's it's not true. just about you. You know what I'm saying? It's about you. You got to give back to other people, you know? And that's, 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 every day I wake up now, man, I'm just thankful for life, Daytuan. Uh, uh, I'm thankful for Michael Cohen, my brother who helped me to edit this book. Hold your head up, Brother Michael, you know what I'm saying? Brother Mike, what's Great going educator, on? you know what I'm saying? Uh, Marissa, who my publicist, you know, Siobhan, Rain, everybody, Regina, my literary agent, everybody here, because it's like, you know, I just love, man, <laughs> I just appreciate life in a different way. In, in a good space. Yeah, and when you write a book like that, what y'all see is Matt Raw. He was, he was telling me, people been hitting, I got a lot of messages from people as they were reading, like, damn, Kevin, I ain't know all of this, son. Yeah, you know I, was hit, I was hitting them while I was reading it, like, damn. Man. You know what I mean? You know? That's crazy. But, you know, the hope is you can turn all that pain and trauma into victory. You know what I mean? And mm. not just survive, but let's figure out how to win, y'all. Y'all want to win, right? Yeah, let's figure is. out how to win. You know what I mean? There it is. So... Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to do we're gonna take a, We're going to take some questions. What's going on, guys? What's All going right. on, Kev? Peace, um, peace. I was looking at the title of the book as I was sitting here, and it, A Boy's Journey into Manhood is what really stood out to me. Yes, sir. And I wanted to know, as a young man, as a young black man growing up without a father, the biggest thing I've noticed is self-identity. Yeah. When did you realize that self-identity, and when did you realize to put it in the title? And I also noticed that when you were talking about Tupac, that's that, that self-identity and father figure, how did you develop that identity without a father figure? Wow. Great question. Wow. That was good. <laughs> I respect that. Well, let me say this. First of all, it's one reason why I mentor and, and try to be a role model for a lot of younger heads because, um, man, I realized uh, I didn't have a positive male role model in my life the first 18 years of my life. Didn't even exist. Nobody. You know what I mean? People will say, well, what about you? You know, I played baseball growing up. I ran track. I used to box. Coaches, it, no, those coaches weren't like the ones in the movies where they put you all the way, <laughs> ride or die. No, it was none of that. It was like, throw the punch, hit the ball, run track, you just run. You know, that was it. It was no talking or anything like that. And so I didn't have any positive role models. In fact, when I graduated from uh, eighth grade in, in Jersey City, my mom's, I'm 14 years old, my mom's had to go up the block and ask a, a, a grown man, you know, uh, can you show my son how to tie a tie so he can wear this tie for his graduation? It's, it was like that. Wow. You feel what I'm saying? Now, y'all, we take this for granted, but this is mad real out here. You know, I got to college. The first thing, the first role model I got, and I said this a couple, a month ago at, at an event we did, uh, was actually a dead black man named Malcolm X. Someone turned me on to Malcolm X. I read the autobiography. This is an era of... of Jesse Jackson running for president, Louis Farrakhan, Nation of Islam blowing up, blah, blah, blah. I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and man, it blew my mind. First of all, because the school system that I went to, I didn't know about Malcolm X. I didn't learn no black history, no Latino history, no Asian history, no history of women, nothing. You feel what I'm saying? And so for the first time, I saw myself in a book, and it was mind-blowing. You know what I mean? How he, uh, you know, his father got killed by the Klan, how his mother had to raise eight kids by herself. Malcolm X was in foster care. The, fam the kids got divided up. You know what I mean? His, eight, his education got interrupted in eighth grade. He became a hustler. Y'all know the story. Malcolm X ends up in jail for seven years. Nation of Islam changes his life. You know what I mean? But I didn't know that he, at the end of the book, he gets killed. So when I get to the end of the book, I'm reading it, and the next thing I'm saying is like, oh, this dude got 15, 16 shots put in him. You know what I'm saying? For and being who he is. He being who he is. <laughs> and I literally broke down crying because I was like, man, I didn't know who this dude was. I just went through this emotional journey with this dude, journey, and now he's shot. 
but in dead, but it opened me up, man, because it made me want to learn about black men in history. You feel what I'm saying? Richard Wright, James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, you know what I'm saying? Paul Robeson. And, you know, uh, I ended up becoming a Muslim, you know, because during this time, anyone who's a hip hop head, knowing in the late 80s, early in the 80s and 90s, you know, the 5% nation of gods and herbs, the nation of Islam had a big impact on hip hop. Why do y'all think we say peace? That comes from the culture. Why do you think a lot of folks don't eat pork? It came from Muslims, you know what I'm saying? And so, they were actually the first examples of black manhood that I saw. When I went to see Minister Farrakhan speak for the first time, I had never seen black men standing like the Madison Square Garden, bow tie, suited up, serious. I was like, and these weren't these hustling preachers that I grew up with. You feel what I'm saying? These were like some serious dudes who were also dropping knowledge about history, you know? And so, how did I get my self identification? Reading, 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 yeah, reading, you know, and observing brothers, observing brothers. You know, even if, hey, like Chuck D, man, I still can't look at Chuck D, the, the, you know, one of the founding members of Public Enemy, as anything other than a father figure. You right. know what I mean? Um, even if some of these heads weren't older than me, the impact of watching Chuck D on TV, KRS One on TV, you feel what I'm saying? You know, Big Daddy Kane, all these folks, because it's like, they were like superheroes to us, they man, because really they were, were saying stuff, you yeah. know, that we didn't, we didn't think we could say. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, that's why I say to uh, brothers all the time, black brothers especially, you know, they always ask me, what, what can we do in the community to help our brothers? Show up. Mm. Show up, son. Be there. Let them see you. Even if you just visit a local school in your community once a month, let them know. And so it was a, it was a process for me. In my book, I take y'all through it. I talk about the stuff I read, read. I talk about the stuff I listen to. When I discovered Bob Marley and Still Pulse and reggae, Candace was talking about reggae. Reggae was as much a part of my education as anything else. I'm listening to Bob Marley. I was like, who is this dude saying all of this stuff? That's real. You know what I mean? I didn't even know what was going on in Jamaica that created this, but it was mind-boggling for me. You know what I mean? And so I just say to heads, man, if you really want to find out who you are, you got to be willing to read. You got to study. You got to travel. Even if it means like, like as a Brooklyn head, it bothers me when heads don't want to leave Brooklyn. My son, you got to get out of Brooklyn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got to go somewhere you ain't never been before. You know what I mean? Sure. Even if it's across the river to Jersey, don't be hating on Jersey that hard. <laughs> and if you're oh, open, man. man, you know your identity starts to take shape. But the other part of it, I got to say this because you know we all carry around that pain and trauma. Ther years of therapy, man, help me. Because I had that hurt from my father not being there, that father hurt I talk about, you know what I mean? And at some point I said to myself, Kev, you know what? Your father ain't thinking about this. You carrying this around for 20, 30 years, you got to be now the man that you wish your father would have been. You have no choice. You know what I mean? Especially when I started hearing heads come up to me when you're in your mid-20s into your 30s, can you be my mentor? Yeah. And you, you realize, you, at first I was rejecting it. Like, I don't want to be yeah. nobody's mentor. I'm trying to still figure this out. But you realize, you know what? Someone's watching you. You do have a responsibility, man, to step up and figure your stuff out. You can't be a kid forever. And you can't be that damaged, wounded kid forever. You can't change what happened there, but you can change what's going forward. You and feel what I'm saying? Others. And inspire others. Yeah. That's it. That's why the book's called A Journey, and it's why the education is in the title. What's up? Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, I, I appreciated like the 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 whole emphasis on a boy, because in black culture, it's not really understood that Pac, you know, you Biggie were kids when they were killed. Like when they were doing what they were doing, the emphasis is not on their them still being children. Right. Like we looked at them as men, but now that I'm 25, I'm like, oh my God! Like I would have been dead a year ago if I was Biggie. And so I wonder, wow. like, if you think about that, right, like how that narrative expands of how we think about age in regards to black men, we look at 12 year olds like grown men because we're taught that, well, you're not going to be here to 25. So you live up like you by 12, you have a midlife crisis because you got 15, you know, you got 13 years left. That's crazy. Right. So That's wow, I, 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 I wanted to I wanted to know, like, how in terms of like your writing, if you've been thinking about this. Was there a purposeful sort of narration that you gave the book in which you emphasized that while you were going through things that kind of like propelled you into manhood prematurely, that you were still a child? Because I think that we even forget that we're still kids. You know what? If I can, thank you for the, the question. These are great questions. If I can just push back on one thing. As a writer, I feel that words have a lot of power. You know, remember I said in, when we were talking that I used to think I ain't going to make it to 15, I ain't going to make it to 20, I ain't going to make it to 25, 30. I think a, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy if we keep putting that out there. Right. I think a lot, what I think about a lot now is, is spiritual energy. 
Y'all feel what I'm saying? And so, you know, I can't control how long I live, you know, for a lot of reasons. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, but I can't control how well I live, and that includes what I think about myself spiritually and mentally. And one thing I want to challenge brothers on, black brothers on, because I do think we're all sisters and brothers, no matter what our race or culture, we're all sisters and brothers. I hope we agree with that, you know what I mean? But black brothers, us specifically, man, you know, let's stop saying I'm not going to make it, you know what I mean? Let's stop saying we're going to try to do something, let's do it. You know, let's stop saying what was not happening, or let's stop saying what we're against, but let's start saying what we're for. I write the book, you know, to answer your question, I just lay it out. Here's my mindset when I was three years old, my first real memories. Here I am at eight years old, my father abandoned me. Here's, um, here I am at 15 years old when I got beat up by a police officer, which really happened, you know what I mean, brutally. You know, here I am at 18 years old when I finally, you know, get to college. Here I'm at 22 years old when I got kicked out of college, you know what I'm saying? Here I am, you know, violent, abusive towards men, women, everybody, just wilding out crazy. Here I am going to therapy trying to figure out how to heal myself from all the madness I've been carrying around my entire life because I believe in being honest about it all. And, you know, some people use the term boy. Some people say man child, like the book Man Child in the Promised Land. Claude Brown, my yeah. favorite book. The way I was raised by my mother, you know, maybe it's old school. She's from the South. She said, you know, 18 years old, you grown. You got to figure this out. I've given you everything that I can give you. You know, now it's up to you. And I, I, I just, I'm saying to y'all what I feel is that you know, we got to step up. I hate the term man up. Enough of that. You know what I mean? But, like, if you're serious about being a whole human being, male or female, you've got you've to be willing to do some work on yourself on a consistent basis. That's the point of the book at the end of the day. This is about spiritual health. This is about mental health. Because otherwise, I mean, real talk, son, I got people in their 40s who still are highly emotionally underdeveloped. I mean, honestly, if you're walking around <laughs> saying, having the same combos when you were 15 years old, there's a problem with that. You know what I mean? And so I just think no matter how old or how young you are, you got to start, at some point, you got to ask yourself, why am I on this planet? What, what, what are my passions? What gifts do I have? What do I want to do with my life? You know, and so in spite of all the stuff that I went through, the one thing I was clear about, I can write. I know how to organize, help people. I'm an activist. And I think I can speak a little bit. And so, you know, um, and yeah, at 24, 25, you know, when I was at Vibe Magazine, you know, I was thinking about all this stuff around black manhood and what is a man and stuff like that. Man, what is a man? Grow the hell up. It's really simple. Grow up. That's what we got to do. Grow up. You know what I mean? And whatever you got to do to figure that out, you have to grow up and realize, you know what, uh, 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 you know, you're... Uh, for us as brothers, it's not fighting ourselves for the rest of our lives. It's not fighting other brothers for the rest of our lives. It's not fighting and disrespecting and hating women for the rest of our lives. It's none of that stuff, man. To me, being a man is being peaceful. It's being loving. It's being critically self-reflective. You know, it's being uh, 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 able to say, I love you to somebody. You know, it's being a man like me. Daytuan's my brother. It's like understanding that you don't need to put the arm in between you when you see someone that's just your homeboy. Just hug them. That's, you know what I'm saying? That's manhood to me. And I just think that a lot of times we don't have conversations about this as black males. And so what ends up happening, what happened to me, which I talk about in the book, you're just out there floating by yourself trying to figure this thing out. You know what I'm saying? And so to me, you know, um, manhood, man, needs to be redefined. You know what I mean? Because I think a lot of the definitions that we got, you know, if it's rooted in patriarchy, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, that ain't a man. You know what I'm saying? If it's rooted in violence, that's not a man. If it's rooted in anything that's not to do with peace and love, then that's not a man to me. That's, that's some creation, and you just a, a puppet on some strings of somebody else. You're just performing, as Bell Hook says, for other people. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't, you know, I don't agree. I think at 24 years old, you're a grown man. You know, you are a grown man. 18 years old, you're a grown man. When I, when I meet, in fact, when I meet young men who are, are six, seven, eight years old, I'm like, hey, what's up, sir? What's your name? Mr. Jackson, nice to meet you, sir. You know what I mean? Not that I'm trying to put extra responsibilities on them, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to prepare them. Like, you're going to have to take a step forward at some point. You can't just be stuck in juvenilization forever. If I could just say this one last point, as much as I love hip-hop, this is in my blood. Part of the problem with not the culture, but the industry of hip hop, because they're two different things to me. The problem with the industry is kind of created this juvenilization where m many of us don't even want to grow up. Right. If you're 35 years old, 40 years old, walking around with your pants sagging, that's part of the problem right there. I get, I'm, I'm like, your cutoff should be like your early 20s at the most. You know what I mean? 
I'm just keeping it real. I'm not talking about Tim. I mean, I wear Tim's, baseball caps, hoodies, fit, fitted caps, all of that stuff. I understand that we have a certain uniform we wear, but it's, if it's certain mentality that you're just carrying around forever, like, I, man, I'll give you an example. There's a young man in Philly. He's 18, 19 years old. His mom called me, hit me up, and said, yo, my son's got a beef. I said, who's he, who's he, who's he has beef with? It was with a 40-year-old dude. The 40-year-old dude was beefing with an 18-year-old dude. You feel what I'm saying? It's crazy. And so we got to challenge each other as we challenge ourselves to redefine manhood away from all the madness that I just described. And that's not going to happen if we don't read Malcolm, for example, and see how he constantly was reinventing himself over and over again. The education. That's it. And that's what the my education. book is about. You know what? I got to reinvent myself. I can't be stuck here angry, bitter, mad at my father, mad at my mother. You know, I don't want to go back to the 90s. I got a lot of friends who want to, what did Nas call them? Stuck in the 90s. Mm, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the 90s was great, but guess what? It ain't coming back. Yeah. Is that your second childhood? Hello. How are you? Good. I want to switch gears a little bit and go back to your activism. And I'm interested in your opinion on how you felt like civil rights movement versus maybe Black Lives Matter today and compare and contrast how you see activism going. And if you see not enough action, too much kind of movements around certain things and then no follow through, et cetera. I think the first thing is the civil rights movement and Black Lives Matter movement are actually the same thing. You know, because they were essentially civil rights movement was created by black people, you know, even though it benefited the whole country and you had people of all different backgrounds participating in the movement, they were saying a generation ago, you know, two generations ago, our lives matter. You know what I mean? Uh, think about how, what, what kick started the civil rights movement? Things like Emmett Till getting killed. How's that any different than Trayvon Martin or Sandra Bland getting killed? You know, protests, marches, calling for, calls for boycotts is the same thing. I think the real tragedy or the real conversation is not us comparing and contrasting Black Lives Matter and the Civil Rights Movement, I think the real problem is why is racism still alive and well in this country in 2015, in spite of all the people who sacrificed their lives, all the little gains that we made, you still have to worry about the fact that you can go to certain places and you can get killed simply because of who you are. You know, and it's the fact crazy. that here in New York City, we can have a black man named Eric Garner just selling some cigarettes, just trying to support his family, right? Selling some, what we call in the black community, in, the, in the inner city, Lucy's, right? Mm -hmm. And then literally be chokehold on a video and no one gets in trouble for it. Just like no one got in trouble for killing Emmett Till because he allegedly, at 15 years of age, in Mississippi, whistled at a white woman. You know what I mean? And so, I don't, it's not about comparing and contrasting civil rights movement and Black Lives Matter. I think the real issue is like, do people really care at all that this is going on in this country that's supposed to be a democracy, allegedly? It's supposed to be a civilized place, allegedly, where you got people just, you know, fearing for the fact that if I go somewhere as a person of color, I could get murdered for it. It doesn't matter if I got a college degree or I got a GED. It doesn't mm. matter if I have a prison record or no prison record. You know, I think y'all should be outraged by what's going on here. Everyone in this room, everyone who's watching this should be outraged that this actually exists in this country in 2015, even with a black man in the White House. That says it doesn't even matter to some folks that there's a black man, in, it's irrelevant to them. You know what I mean? Because they don't value the lives of people as their sisters and brothers, as equals, as human beings. Uh, that, and my family's from South Carolina. Guess what? That pastor of that church where those people got killed while they were praying, he actually is related to my family because he went to the same church as my grandmother in Jasper County in the low country of South Carolina. I mean, we're all connected to this stuff. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know what else I could say. I don't know if black lives matter. That's how I feel. That's my response. You know what I mean? Does it really matter? Does it really matter? You know what I mean? I'm an activist, I'm an organizer. I've been doing this work for 30 years. You gotta understand where I'm coming from, sister, and I laid out in the book. In the 1980s in New York, it was Eleanor Bumpers. It was Michael Stewart. It was Howard Beach. It was Bensonhurst going into the early 90s. So this is actually not new. Part of the problem is people think this is all new, some new phenomenon. There's always been these cases. My great grandfather, as I said in the book and I said up here, he was killed by white racist men in South Carolina for his land over 100 years ago. And so the problem is that we are perpetually in a state of siege, perpetually dealing with racism from every single angle. And so, you know, I don't, I think we're having the wrong conversations, what I'm saying. I think the real question should be, what are y'all willing to do, people of color, to challenge racism in this country on a real and serious basis? And then if you are a white sister or brother who understands that you benefit from this system of racism just because of the color of your skin, what are you willing to do on a consistent basis to challlenge like that. that, to fight that? 
that's the conversation. You know what I mean? Not what do I think about Black Lives Matter, not what do I think about Barack Obama, not what do I think about this racial profiling case or that racial profiling case. What is it you're willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to sacrifice, you know, to change this thing so that people don't have to walk around, you know, uh, uh, feeling like their lives are in jeopardy? Or to the men here, let's flip it from race for a second. Men, you know, you heard Taylor Johnson's poem, Why Should Women in New York City from the moment they leave their homes, when they're walking down the street, they get on subways, they feel like they can get harassed, you know, sexually assaulted, raped, or murdered simply because they're women every single day of their lives. Now, some of y'all don't want to hear this as men, but it's the same question. Are you willing to challenge the power and privilege that you have, that you benefit from just because of who you are, because of your race or your gender, that makes the person who's opposite of you a victim of your power and privilege? You feel what I'm saying? And so it's about power and privilege. It's about power and privilege, who has it and who doesn't have it. We can have all kinds of slogans. We can have all kinds of movements. They come and go. I've been a part of everything you can name. I talk about it in the book. But at the end of the day, are you willing to really stand up and be a voice for change in this country and on this planet? Mm. That's the real issue. What are you willing to sacrifice? Serious biz. Peace, peace. Peace, man. Um, I had to write this down. Um, respect to Daytuan for being a journalist of the culture and moderating. Appreciate that. I read who's, um, I read who's gonna take the weight with Nod the Gangstar as a class assignment at Pace University wow. down the street. Mm. And was there when you spoke to us as a student in Professor Grinner's class. Oh my um, gosh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, um, how that means I'm just, getting old, sir. Uh, no. <laughs> we'll just say it was a couple years ago. Okay. <laughs> You're being kind, sir. <laughs> how has your skill and perspective as a writer grown and informed how you view the world, past, present, and future, since writing that book? Wow. Mm. That was the early 2000s, yeah. I believe, right? That's a long time ago. It's a great book, though. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Right. Who's going to take the weight? I got that from Gangstar, who got that from a Cool in the Gang song. So, you know, I want to give a shout out to Cool in the Gang as well. That was a song in the 70s. Gangstar, rest in peace, guru. You know what I'm saying? Um, wow. Um, I wrote that book when I was in the middle of my depression, to be honest with you. I was very depressed, you know? Uh, again, that's why I admire Kendrick for what he says in his music. When I heard I for the first time, you know, and he's talking about I'm trying to love myself. That was a period when I was trying to figure out how to love myself, you know what I'm saying? Because I had no idea how to do it. You know, I had, it was about a year or two after I had stopped drinking, you know? I talk about it in the book, man, where I was just drinking and drinking and drinking. Sometimes I would drink to wake up. Sometimes I would drink to go to sleep. That's why I'm a vegan today, y'all. That's why I don't drink anymore. I'll never drink again. That's why I run marathons. That's why I take my health and wellness seriously. Because I realized at that time I was treating my, when I asked the question, who's going to take the weight, I was actually talking to myself. You feel what I'm saying? You know, because I was treating myself like a garbage can, you know what I mean? You know, and when you don't love yourself, you, you, you do things to, to destroy yourself, you know what I mean? And so that's what shifted for me, you know what I mean? Um, what shifted for me, I was in a place of confusion about what my purpose was on the planet, you know? It was right at the beginning where I was like, you know, do I go back to the activism? Do I try to go back to being a full-time journalist, you know? Um, and I made a, a, a decision at a certain point, like, I'm an activist, man. I'm an organizer. I'm not going to apologize for it. My life is about helping people. That's what I want to do. I happen to be able to write, you know, uh, and I had to fall back in love with writing again. That was, it's been a journey, you know. I honestly, brother, don't remember a single word I wrote on who's going to take the weight. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why lie? And, and some artists out there know what I'm talking about. Like, I don't read every book that I write out of the 12. I've never go back and read them again. People come up to me like, yo, and who's going to take the weight on page 203? I'm like, I hear you, son. You know what I'm saying? Word, I said that. It you know was what real. I mean? It was real. You know, people, you know, it's like, um, <laughs> it's funny. I, you know, it's hard to look back at yourself. You know what I mean? Mm. But you have to do it periodically. That's why this book was important to me, you know? Um, but I appreciate it because I meet people like you all the time who say, Kev, you spoke at my school in 98, you spoke at my school in 2000 or 2000 this or whatever, you know. And I think about something Maya Angelou said more than ever because I've been the negative person, the toxic person. I try to be positive now as much as possible. And if I make a mistake, I apologize. Forgive me for disrespecting you, anything like that. But I think what Maya Angelou said, you know, people are not going to remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's what shifted for me. I think about that now. How do I want to leave people feeling? You know what I mean? That's important. So, there was one more. <clears throat> hey, peace. How you doing, Kev? How you doing, Dick Twine? Peace. peace. Um, sitting where you are now, 
in your life is um, you have some distance from the events that you speak about in your book. Yeah. So that makes you able to reflect on it more. Because I'll give you an example. Like I went back to college when I was a little bit older. So I was around younger people, black, white, Asian, a lot of people. And I would, you know, I'm a hip hop head. And so when I would bring up some of my favorite uh, works like um, the Purple Tape, for example, or even um, the classic uh, Rather Unique from, from, from my AZ, you know, and yeah. I, and I was, I didn't feel that old at the time, but it would shock me when I would speak to young people and they didn't know what I was talking about, right? I, I think I was that old, but if I, I did have good conversations with people from other races that like kind of knew our history a little bit better than we did. So can huh. you speak to the significance of that a little bit? Because I think that's what your book represents. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, a few things I want to say. Um, you know, um, how many of y'all out there are hip hop heads or touched by hip hop in some way? All right, no doubt. So, as a, you a lifelong hip hop head, sir? All day. All day. <laughs> me too. All day. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to count. You saw me count. I'm like, one, two, three, four, five. So, so you heard me earlier say hip hop industry and hip hop culture. You know, I represent the culture, even though I've been a part of the industry as well. And for me, the culture means I got to acknowledge Cool Herc, mm. Grandmaster Flash, Grand Wizard Theodore, Grandmaster Kaz, you know, Africa Bambada, Universal Zulu Nation. You feel where I'm going with this? The Rocksteady crew. You know, I got to acknowledge that African Americans and Latinos and West Indians in New York created this thing called hip hop culture. Those three groups. Poor people. They were all poor people. We took something that was nothing and made it into something. Two turntables, a microphone, you know, some spray paint, magic markers, right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, our, our record collection, our family's record collection, you know? Uh, and you know, what is the fifth element of hip hop? You got the DJ, MC, graffiti writing, dance element, knowledge, 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 which is you talking about. That's the fifth element of hip hop culture, right? And I'm clear about that. I'm also clear that there's multiple generations of us. You know, Cool Herc, last year at the Schomburg, y'all can find this on YouTube, I sat down with Cool Herc for his 60th birthday. Cool Herc came from Jamaica in the West Indies in 1967 to the Bronx, New York, where the thing was exploded. You know what I'm saying? So his generation, I'm in my late 40s, my generation. We grew up with Run DMC, Kane, Public Enemy, you know what I mean? You know, and then there's the generation behind us. So there's at least three, if not four, generations of hip hop heads. Yeah, you feel what I'm saying? You know, and it's like, like sometimes me and Taylor, she's my assistant as well, we're working. You know, her mom's is my age, and so, so I'll put on some Tupac or something. I'm like, okay, we bump into the same music because we have the same reference points. You know, we speak the same language, you know what I'm saying? And so I think we gotta be very clear that it's multiple generations. And then I feel, brother, What's our responsibility? We got to be young elders now. We got to be teachers. In my book, as Daytona tell you, there's a whole section in my book about hip hop history. You know, and um, there were some people, we'll leave out who they were, who didn't think that part of the book was actually important to be in the book. And I'm like, oh no, that's going to be in that the has book. To be in the because book. Because that's a part of who I am. <laughs> exactly. And hip hop is the dominant youth culture on the planet over the last 40 plus years. That's true. Everywhere you go in the world, it's hip hop. Whether you like it or not, it's hip hop. You know what I'm saying? And so inside the book, because I realized I'm going to have heads coming to the book reading it, I'm like, yo, you got me at rooftop. You got me at Latin Quarters. You got me at the Underground. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about dancers like the Trot and the Pee Wee Herman, because I realized, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about fast shoelaces and Adidas and Pumas. I'm talking about how we used to say fresh and deaf and word, and word is bond. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, I got to, just like how if you read Malcolm X's autobiography and you got that whole period where he was a young person, he was in the, in the whole culture mm -hmm. of bebop, mm -hmm. I literally said, I'm going to do that for my book, but it's going to go from bebop to hip hop. You know what I'm saying? And so what I'm getting at, rather than condemn or be mad at younger heads who might not know what you're talking about you take the time with love and compassion and just share it you know what I mean you know Taylor don't we talk about music all the time you know what I'm saying and she got Shazam on her phone so I'm like she's like who's that bam okay you know what I'm saying <laughs> and then I say well this is who they are you know this is why they're important you know what I'm saying this is AZ this is this person this is that person you feel what I'm saying because this is literally we got we got legends in this room we got, you know, these are, these are, these are our legends. You know, for hip hop, you know, this is our Coltrane. This is our Eric Dolphy. This is our Miles That's Davis. Real. This is our Billie Holiday. And we got to salute these heads. We got to let people know that they're in this space. And if, there's no, if there's, there's no you, if there was no them. You feel what I'm saying? And so I pay homage to that. And so I just say, man, do it with love and compassion. You know, don't be mad if heads don't know something. I, I mean, you heard me say, I didn't know who Malcolm X was until I was 18 years old. Someone who was older said, 
this is Malcolm X. I actually thought it was Malcolm the 10th, Roman Numa. <laughs> I said that number, I was mad ignorant. I was like, who's Malcolm the 10th, yo? <laughs> who that? Is he one of them royal cats from England or something? I didn't know who he was. Oh, but you understand man. what I'm saying, brother? We're in Apple store. I use my iPhone, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I can guarantee you every week I'm posting something about hip hop culture, hip hop history, yep. or something about black culture or American history, Same American thing. culture. Use the technology, man. You know what I'm saying? And that you'll be surprised how many heads you can reach if you just share stuff with people. Sometimes I'll just post stuff, man, you know, and I'll flip it. I'll go from hip hop to some jazz stuff or to some rock and roll stuff. But I'm like, you know what? People are paying attention if you're on Instagram. You got a responsibility to use that stuff. France Fanon, the great West Indian uh, scholar and psychiatrist, said, you know, years ago in Wretched the Earth, meet the people where they are and then you bring them bring, forward. Bring them up. Yeah. That's what we got to do. You know what I'm saying? So that's the way I look at it. There it is. We good? We good? <laughs> That's the same thing. You know you're from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all for tonight. Thank Make you. Make sure. Oh, definitely. Thank you definitely, so much. Kev. Amazing speech. Make sure you go grab it.